I want to bring a message this morning about weakness. Weakness made strong. We are all of us in some ways weak, and all of us in other ways strong. These terms are relative, they are comparative, but what I want to talk about this morning is weakness that God can take and make strong. And we have a wonderful passage of Scripture in Hebrews chapter 11, and what we call this chapter the, the Bible's Hall of Faith. Uh, many of the heroes of the Old Testament are mentioned here, and the things that they did through God, that they exhibited faith. And here in chapter uh, 11 of Hebrews, verse 32 through 40, we find a phrase that I want to just kind of key in on for this message. We'll begin in verse 32. And what more shall I say? For the time would fail me to tell of Gideon, of Barak, of Samson, and of Jephthah, of David also, and Samuel, and of the prophets, who through faith subdued kingdoms, wrought righteousness, obtained promises, stopped the mouths of lions, quenched the violence of fire, escaped the edge of the sword. And here's the part that I want us to really pay attention to. Out of weakness were made strong. Out of weakness were made strong. Waxed valiant in fight, turned to flight the armies of the aliens. Women received their dead raised to life again, and others were tortured not accepting deliverance that they might obtain a better resurrection. And others had trial of cruel mockings and scourgings, yea, moreover, of bonds and imprisonment. They were stoned, they were sawn asunder, were tempted, were slain with the sword. They wandered about in sheepskins and goatskins, being destitute, afflicted, tormented, of whom the world was not worthy. They wandered in deserts and in mountains, in dens and caves of the earth, and these all, having obtained a good report through faith, received not the promise. God having provided some better thing for us, that they without us should not be made perfect or should not be made complete. Now what the writer is saying here is that God's people aren't done going through hardships. God's people are still going to have times where they are weak and they are going to have to have faith. And their pain that they went through is added to our pain. And their trials are added to our trials before God is going to bring the kingdom. So let's talk this morning about weakness made strong. We need to remind ourselves sometimes that real strength is strength that we have that we operate in the Lord. It is only when we admit our own inadequacies that we can experience God's fullness. It is only that we realize what we can't do that we realize what God can do. It is only when we get to the end of our ability that we see God's ability kick in. And this is what we want. We want to see God do what only God can do. And so we must understand that our weakness is the arena that God uses to manifest His strength. And so let's understand, weakness is not necessarily a bad thing. Now, we don't like it. Uh, as human beings, I would rather be strong than weak. Uh, the areas in my life where I perhaps am not as strong, I wish I were. Uh, I wish I were as strong as I were back when I was 25. I'm not. Uh, I don't like that. Uh, comparatively, we may be weaker now than we were at one point. Uh, I went into the gym one time at a hotel, and I was thinking, well, I'm going to lift some weights. It's been a long time since I've lifted weights, and I was thinking I should lift some weights. And so I got up to the place where you stand up and do some presses, you know, and I loaded up the bar uh, with 120 pounds, which used to be what I could work out with. And so I got on the, under the bar, and I got it up to my chest, and I went, <clears throat> <clears throat> and I managed to get it up one time. And when I came down, I realized that's too much weight. And so I began to pull some weight off, and I got to about 100 pounds. Said, Surely I can do this. And I, I pushed, and I got it up about three pounds. Listen, I'm embarrassed to say I had to get down to about 85 pounds before I could really get a workout with this. I used to be stronger. I'm not as strong as I was. But I still think I'm pretty good for 67 years old, but that's beside the point. Weakness is not necessarily a bad thing as much as it is a common thing. Uh, and you and I are all of us weak uh, in some scale. 
Now, if we limit ourselves to a particular scale, like I just did, I might be pretty strong for 67. I might say I'm strong. But if I put myself on another scale for all ages, no, not at all. So the idea is, listen, listen, when we bring God into it, when we bring that scale into it, we're looking at a bunch of weaklings here. All of us are weaklings and we need God's strength. So that's what we're talking about today. Not only do we have just human frailty and human weakness compared to God, but we have human frailty in the area of besetting sins, the fallen nature, the weakness of our resolve, the weakness of our character. Sometimes it's the most... Uh, the thing we struggle with the most is how weak we are when it comes to doing the right thing and, and avoiding the wrong thing. Matthew 26, 41, Jesus said, watch and pray that ye enter not into temptation. The spirit is indeed willing, but the flesh is weak. So Jesus himself looking at his disciples, and he could say the same thing looking at you and I, the flesh is weak. So when we read about those who out of weakness were made strong, what we're seeing is God doing something. These areas of weakness uh, we must deal with. Now, let's ask ourselves this question. How, How does one become weak? Where does weakness come from? Why am I weak? Well, there's two main reasons, and I'm going to deal with them uh, this morning. First of all, we may be weak by design. And you say, well, what do you mean by that? Well, what I mean by that is God failed to give you a strength. Now, do you like that? Maybe not. Is that a truth that hits you a little bit sideways? Maybe so. But I challenge you to deny the truth of it. Did God make you perfect? Are you skilled in all things? Are you musically gifted, athletically gifted, mechanically gifted, socially gifted, intellectually gifted, and all of these different areas all at the same time at the highest level? Anybody like that here today? Any absolute, complete, well-rounded genius that could also run a marathon? Uh, Most geniuses I know are still lacking in some other areas. It seems like when God gives you one strength, he gives you a weakness somewhere else. Don't you find that to be so? Listen, there's areas in my life when I think I'm, maybe I'm pretty good here, but otherwise, I'm, nah, nah, not so good here. That's the way it is with all of us. So listen, didn't God make you? Aren't you a creature of God? Uh, didn't God form you in the womb? Didn't he know your parts hidden before they were even born? Doesn't God know you? Uh, listen, the fact is there are things about you that God didn't give you that he did give somebody else. We don't make ourselves. As I've said before, none of us, when we're in the womb, have an agenda. When we're in the womb, we we don't think, when I'm getting out of here, I'm going to be a math scientist. There's no such thing as that. Uh, you're, you're just who you are, and then opportunities come after you're born. And you either have inclinations and abilities for it or not. Uh, some things are just in our DNA. So you are sometimes, you've got to understand, you are weak by design. Uh, listen, even Jesus, Jesus left the throne of glory, and he became a human being, and he humbled himself and limited himself to be a human being. In other words, there were some areas of his life where he willfully laid aside his divinity, laid aside his power so he could live as a human being and he could die for our sins. So Jesus, by design, became weaker as the human being, Jesus Christ, than he was the second person of the Trinity pre-Bethlehem. So we are often weak by design. Now, there's a, there's a passage of Scripture I want us to go to. It's 2 Corinthians chapter 12, and here the Apostle Paul is sharing with his readers and with all of us through the Holy Spirit about himself. He's talking about himself. And the things that he was talking about were all the things that God had done through him. Amazing things. For one thing, he wrote 13 books of the New Testament. The Apostle Paul had seen Jesus. He had done many great miracles and had been given great revelations. And so he said this in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 7, And lest I should be exalted above measure through the abundance of revelations. Now pay attention to the wording. There was given to me. There was given 
to me a thorn in the flesh, the messenger of Satan to buffet me, lest I should be exalted above measure. Now, let's just stop right here and realize what was happening. The Apostle Paul had been raised very high by God. God had elevated him. God had brought him to heights of revelation. So what the Lord did, lest he be exalted above measure and perhaps fall into pride or or, or self-reliance, God grounded Paul. He grounded him with this thing called a thorn in the flesh. Notice, he said, God gave me this thorn in the flesh that he referred to as the messenger of Satan to buffet me, lest I should be exalted above measure. Now, did Paul like this? No. Notice what happened. For this thing I besought the Lord thrice, that it might depart from me. And he said unto me, My grace is sufficient for thee. Listen, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Now, this is a stage of Christian growth that is difficult to obtain. Paul had reached this state where he realized that it's not about me. It's not about my abilities. It's not about my intellect. It's not about my oratorical ability. It is about God working through not my strengths, but my weaknesses. He said, I asked the Lord to take this away from me. Now you think about it. The Apostle Paul, one of God's top leaders, one of God's top evangelists and top missionaries, don't you think that it would make sense for him to operate at 100% capacity? Wouldn't you think it would be better for him to be 100% physically healthy and not hindered in any way? Wouldn't it be nice if he could spend all of his time in service to the Lord and not have to spend time being doctored and attended to with his physical ailment? That's the way we would think logically. But the Apostle Paul, he thought, I don't need this. I'm praying for the Lord to take it away. And the Lord said, my strength is made perfect in weakness. So here's what Paul came to. Most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities, that's my weaknesses, that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Therefore, I take pleasure in infirmities, in reproaches, in necessities, in persecutions, in distresses for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then am I strong. Now, this is the most counterintuitive thing that a human being can deal with. But the Apostle Paul realized that God is the one who has me. God is the one who's using me. And I don't have to like everything he does, but I will spiritually exercise myself to rejoice in it because the work of God is improved through the weakness that he gave me. So I submit to you today that the Apostle Paul became weak by design. It was God himself who gave Paul this weakness. But this weakness became an arena for the strength of God to work through him. Listen, there are things about you and me that if God doesn't tether, if he doesn't limit, if he doesn't filter, if he doesn't squelch to some degree, we're going to self-destruct. We may want to hold on to those things Uh, We may want to uh, increase those things that would absolutely ruin us in our walk with the Lord. I remember a man was talking about one time, he said, boy, I could really serve the Lord. I could really be great. I could really be somebody if I wasn't married to this woman who is just a kind of a ball and chain. And I I, I hate to hear a man talk bad about his wife. I, I never do enjoy it. And so I told him, I said, how do you know that you wouldn't be a drunk lying in a gutter, but for this woman who puts up with you? when you don't deserve it. And uh, you you might be a a total deadbeat if it weren't for that woman. Don't you talk like that? Why? Because what he saw as a weakness was more likely in his life a strength. She kept him on the right track. She kept him from flying off the handle. Listen, I know some things about myself and my wife. I know some things about us. We're almost 50 years married now, 49 this year. And it won't be long. We'll be celebrating our golden anniversary. I know I don't look that old, but we got married when we were nine. And Long story, but, but here's the thing. I've been married long enough to know this. Sometimes I think of myself, I'm the kite and she's the string. And, you know, the kite uh, likes to take risks. The, the kite likes to catch the wind. The kite likes to be out there in the outdoors. And, and uh, listen, but listen, let me tell you something. That kite ain't going nowhere without that string, but flopping around. Go out there and try to fly a kite without a string. Just throw it up in the air and see what happens not going to work. Listen, the things that my wife adds to me 
And sometimes the way she puts a little, you don't want to do that. I said, yes, I do. She says, no, you don't. I said, yes, I do. She says, no, you don't. And I really, well, maybe I don't. Why? Because that's the thing that God gave me to tether me and keep me from flopping around like a kite in the wind. Listen, I know that. And, and so I'd be, the, I'd be the biggest fool in the world to say, well, who is she to tell me? Who is she to contribute? No, I tell you, there's two brains are better than one. And one of those brains has more sense. So I listen, listen to that one sometimes. Listen, that's just the truth. Uh, listen, we are all weak to some degree by design. Every one of us in some ways are weak. But listen, your weakness is a place where someone else's strength can play a role. And now you've got a relationship, don't you? Now you've got someone to deal with. Now you've got someone to be a blessing to and from. And so designed weakness is not a curse and it's not a sin. It's evidence of God's sovereignty in our lives. His strength is made perfect in our weakness. And so the areas in which I am weak, that is a place where God can demonstrate himself. Now, here's the other part of this. We can be weak by default. By default. And there's three ways that we can be weak when it's us. We fail to be strong when we could have been strong. Uh, we, we end up weak through our own effort or lack of effort, we could say. Okay, so we're weak sometimes by default. Now, that is one who simply fails to be strong when he or she could have been strong. And the first area that this can happen is the word ignorance. Ignorance. Now, I don't think it's unfair to say that in this room today, there is an amazing amount of ignorance. Now, did I just hurt your feelings? If I did, it's because you have pride. Let me give you an illustration. If I were to do it, I can't, but if I were to do it, if I were to make a great big giant circle here in this auditorium, and this big giant circle, which wouldn't be large enough, by the way, but if we said this big large circle would be what God knows. That's the collective knowledge of the universe. What's true, what's real, what's right. And then we were to try to put a circle within the circle of the collective knowledge of humanity together. Every book written, everything that we know, everything we think we know, it wouldn't even be a pinprick inside of here. Much less the things that I just know myself. So let's put ourselves in perspective. All of us, even the most educated, even the most well-read, even Jeopardy champions... All of us are amazingly ignorant in many ways. Now, that being so, ignorance is just a reality. But ignorance is worse when we have been given information, when we have been given data, when we have been given the knowledge, and we willfully reject it because of some ideology or because of some sin or because of some personal grievance. Listen, willful ignorance is a sin. When you could know something and should know something and have been told something and it's true and others going to testify to it that it's true and you willfully reject it, that means you are weak on purpose. You are weak in the area of intellect. So there's ignorance. But there's another thing that happens. It's, we can be by default by fear, by fear. We're afraid. Now, lack of faith in God and his word can make you weak because you'll be immobilized. You'll be stuck. You'll be afraid to go forward with fear. Fear disables and fear demoralizes. When you are not confident and when you're not operating in faith, you will operate in fear and that can create weakness. And then there's another one, is laziness. Laziness. Uh, it's easier to be lazy than to be strong. Uh, sometimes you could be strong and should be strong, except you just don't exercise what it takes to be strong and to maintain strength. It's easier to live with the weakness than to work to overcome it and exercise the strength uh, that is uh, going to help you to be strong. Uh, it's an attitudinal thing. So we can be weak by design, and we, we can't help that. That's just God. 
but we can also be weak by default because we just fail to be strong. Now, listen, there are times when we could be stronger if we make up our minds to be. There are times when we are attitudinally not strong. Now, I'm a big a fan of sports, and, and, and I love this thing, this chemical that God gave us, and, and it's a wonderful drug. It's a natural drug. It's called adrenaline. Now, isn't it true that, that you can do things when adrenaline kicks in that you couldn't otherwise? There are times when I have found myself so weary that I can hardly go up the stairs to our bedroom. But you get me out on a ballpark, and I can run the bases to third and leave a trail of dust behind me. Same knees, same old joints, same old wreck of a body, but what's the difference? Adrenaline, an attitudinal thing that kicks in a chemical reaction that turns you into something, now I'm 25 again. It's amazing. And then afterwards, I'm... And then I can't go up the stairs when I get home. Now, that's true with a lot of things. It's not just adrenaline, but there's a, there's a spiritual angle here too. There are some things that we can do if we just make up our minds to do it, to not be ignorant, to not be fearful, and to not be lazy. And you know what I think is the least forgivable of these? Because the Lord knows that we're ignorant about many things. He knows that we sometimes fear. But I think laziness is the worst. Laziness is just the worst. There's no excuse for laziness. When God has given us the ability and God has given us the opportunity, do it. Go after it. Uh, it's attitudinal. Uh, just make yourself go forward. And then also, we can be weak by decision. By decision. And this is the saddest thing of all. When someone decides to be weak. When we decide to give in to our human frailty, we decide to be weak. When we decide to follow the flesh, we decide to be mastered by it. When we decide to reject discipline, we decide to forfeit the strength that comes only through discipline. When we decide to live as if there is no God, we decide to give up the strength that only God can provide. To be weak by decision is the saddest thing of all. Romans 15.1 says, We then that are strong ought to bear the infirmities of the weak and not to please ourselves. I think sometimes that strength is a matter of will. I choose to be strong. I choose not to be weak. There are times when you have to just suck it up and go with it and do what it takes. Uh, I'm a, a fan of... of um, uh, Theodore Roosevelt. Uh, I've read several of his biographies, and uh, what a, uh, an inspiration his life is. If you really read and find out what made that man who he was, he started out in life as a little boy with a very thin chest, and he had asthma so bad that the doctor said he may not even grow up. He, he, he would never be robust. He would never be active, and he wheezed, and he coughed, and he was just a sickly little boy. But his dad uh, took him aside and he said, Teddy, he said, I I've taken a room and I've turned it into a gym. There's all kind of exercise equipment in there and there's all kind of things that you need to work with. And he said, son, you don't have a strong body. You're going to have to make your body. You're going to have to make it. And the, the, the story goes that uh, he reared back with his head and he stuck out his little boy chin and he said, I'll make my body. His high little falsetto voice. And so he spent hours and hours in that room working out and exercising. And he went outdoors and became an outdoorsman. He became an athlete and became one of the ro most robust human beings this country has ever produced. A bully, uh, the, the rough rider. I mean, all of that came from this skinny little boy. But here's what he determined. I'm not going to be weak. I'm not going to be weak. I'm going to be strong and I'm going to make my body. Now, I believe that human determination is up to us. God can bring us to a place. He can create an opportunity, but we've got to make up our minds to do it. Well, listen, when the children of Israel were brought to the brink of the Holy Land, they had a weakness attack. They had a weakness fit, and they decided to be weak, and they decided they couldn't do it. And for 40 more years, they had to wander around the wilderness till a generation got up and decided they'd be strong enough to go in. It's a matter of the mind. It's a matter of the heart. So there is weakness by decision. You know, we may have compassion for someone who has an injury or an acquires a weakness through some tragedy, 
uh, perhaps they had an illness that reduced them physically or perhaps uh, had uh, something that, that, that caused them a physical infirmity. Uh, but you know, when someone decides to be weak, uh, that's just laziness. You know, we can do all we can to help somebody who's weak and to bear their infirmities. And to, uh, but you know, what I found out that many times these people who have a real physical infirmity are stronger than you and I who don't. They've learned how to push against something. They've learned how to overcome their problems. Acts chapter 20, verse 35 said, I have showed you all things, how that so laboring you ought to support the weak. And to remember the words of the Lord Jesus, how he said it is more blessed to give than to receive. Let every one of us please his neighbor for his good to edification. What the Bible wants us to do, what God wants us to do, listen, you choose to be a contributor. You choose to be a giver. There's three stages in a man's maturity. There's that boyhood stage where others are taking care of him. He is an object of care from others. And then as he matures, he is able to take care of himself. But then as he, as he matures further, he is able to take care of himself and others as well. In the Christian faith, we are all to strive to be that third level of maturity, to take care of ourselves and also ask ourselves, how can I be a blessing to someone else? How can I be uh, God's uh, hands and his feet and his mouth to someone else? Decide to be one who gives. Decide to be one who helps the weak. Decide to be one who is strong. Be a worker, not a shirker. I was talking to this 85-year-old man one time, and he went all the time to the nursing home. He had a ministry there. He's 85 years old. And I said, well, uh, what made you want to do that? And he said, well, somebody's got to take care of those old people. I liked his attitude. Uh, he was able to get around. He was in better shape than a lot of those that were in there. And he was there to take care of the old people. And uh, what a blessing. What, a, what an attitude that man had. We've talked about where does weakness come from. Let's deal with it. Let's talk about now how to overcome weakness. Because we know we have it. We know it's there. And wherever it came from, it's a place that God can use for His glory. So if you find yourself weak, and if you recognize weakness, how do we become stronger? Well, one of the most important ways to be strong and stronger is the joy of the Lord. The joy of the Lord. In fact, the, I think it's in the Psalms. The joy of the Lord is my strength. The joy of the Lord is my strength. What the Bible is saying here is attitudinally in the mind and in the heart, that creates a strength. That's why God is so good. That's why following Jesus is so helpful because he provides for us that inner strength that we so need. Our attitude is very important to overcoming weakness. When we think right and maintain a right attitude, we have energy for resisting the things that can defeat us. And then next is walking in the Spirit. Walking in the Spirit of God. The flesh is weak, but the Spirit is strong. Prayer. When we pray, we become stronger. Our weaknesses are made stronger when we fellowship with the Lord in faith. Prayer in the Bible is always associated with spiritual strength. Prayer is strengthening. So you want to be strong? Maintain a positive attitude in the Lord and pray. Also, help from others. Help from others. A uh, father was teaching his son uh, how to work and how to do things. And so he said, son, go out there and pull that stump out of the ground. They were clearing some land. And so the boy went out there and he pulled and pulled and he couldn't seem to get any headway out of it. He was pulling on that stump. And so the father went out and he said, son, are you, are you using all the strength that's available to you here? Are you using all your strength? And he says, I'm trying. And he says, uh, son, no, you haven't asked me to help yet. And you see, that's the thing he wanted him to depend on. Once, when you get a job that's over your head, when you get a job that's too big for you, it's not wrong to ask for help. Here's his dad right here, twice as strong or more than he was, and they together were able to then pull that stump right out of the ground. And listen, that, that's what I think the lesson God wants us to know. Uh, have you used all the strength available to you? Have you asked God to help? Have you asked someone else to help? One of the hardest things to do for us sometimes is to admit that we can't do it by ourselves. Isn't that true? I want to do this myself. 
tried to tie my shoes when I was a kid. I got all tangled up, had a mess of it. And I'd gotten mad and I took my shoe off and threw it. So mom comes over and she tries to teach me again how to tie my shoe. And I finally got it down. You have to have help. You have to have help. The little things in life. Help from others. Alliances are beneficial. There's strength in numbers. And plus it's more fun. There's a lot of things you can get done with help from others. It's God's will for his strength to be made perfect through weakness. Listen, there's one thing that we understand is that if we want to be strong, we have to have help from God. We have to have help from others. And lastly is exercise. Exercise. This is the most rewarding thing that there is to work at it, to exercise. The more you work at it, the more you exercise, the stronger you will get. And just as exercising our muscles makes us strong, if we ex ourselves against human frailty, if we exercise ourselves against our besetting sins, if we ex our, exercise ourselves against doubt and fear, we will become stronger in those areas. The more work we do, even in our weakness, the stronger we will get. Now, one of the things about work is, is uh, there's a certain kind of work that requires courage, and it's called fighting. Now, fighting is work. It's, it's interesting to me how close work and fighting are together. Uh, both of them require a degree of energy. Both of them require a degree of commitment. Both of them require a degree of putting up with things that they'd rather not put up with. Uh, they even wear similar clothing. When you go to work, especially a physically demanding work, you're not wearing pajamas and house slippers. You're wearing work clothes and maybe boots. The same with the military, same with fighting. You're, you're, you're equipped to do what you have to do. Uh, fighting is a courageous form of work. I think not only about fighting uh, physically and in, in, in battle, but uh, think about the things we use that term for. We say someone who is going through chemotherapy, we say they're, they are battling cancer. They're fighting cancer. Listen, they're not just working, they're fighting. They're fighting. They're putting forth effort against an enemy. They are putting forth resolve. They are dealing with pain. They're dealing with misery. Often this treatment is taxing. And so they, they are fighting cancer. They're battling it. Another term we use, and I've known people, and you may be one, uh, they're battling depression. They're battling it. Had a member of our church, uh, and he battled depression big time. He, he uh, had a job he loved, a career that he enjoyed, but he acquired epilepsy and would have seizures, and so he was let go from his job, and he couldn't do his job anymore. It was the only thing he knew how to do, and he was, he was benched. He was sidelined, and uh, he, he was young enough to where he felt like he had more years to work, and, and now he's at home, and, and he got depressed, and he got sad, and he, he just got down. And uh, he was like that character that, that you saw in the funny papers many years ago that had the dark cloud over his head. Just everywhere he went, he had the dark cloud over his head. And he would come to talk to me. And he would, he would just, uh, you know, talk to me and lay all this bad stuff and how rotten he felt and all this. And, and I'd listen and, and be kind. And when he left, I felt depressed too. I mean, he would, he would take it and I would just, got, I was just like sucking up all this negative energy. And when he left, I'd go home and say, boy, yeah, I'm really down for, you know. But then later he would say, what a blessing it was to come and talk to me that I made him feel better. And I thought, well, listen, I'm glad that, that, that his weakness came in and I was able to take it and share it and maybe it wasn't as big a burden. But here's the thing. He fought against it. He worked against it. He didn't give into it like some people did. He tried to maintain a good attitude. He tried to get out. He tried to maintain a good positive uh, emotional way. He pushed against it. He pressed against it. He resisted it. And he was mostly victorious over it. And I admired him for it. Listen, there's things in life that, that can overwhelm us. But if we fight against it, if we work against it, we can win. We can be victorious. Some of you know exactly what I'm talking about. You could tell your story and you could give God the glory. There's many examples in history. You think of a man named Johnny Fulton. Johnny Fulton was run over by a car at the age of three. He suffered crushed hips, broken ribs, and a fractured skull. And a compound fractures in his legs. But he did not, uh, it didn't look as if he would live, but he did live. But he would not give up. 
In fact, he later ran the half mile in less than two minutes, became a track star. Walt Davis was totally paralyzed by polio when he was nine years old, but he did not give up, and he became the Olympic high jump champion of 1952. Lou Gehrig, uh, the great baseball player, was such a clumsy ball player that the boys in his neighborhood would not let him play on their team. But he was committed, and he did not give up, and he kept practicing, and eventually his name was entered into the Baseball Hall of Fame. Woodrow Wilson could not read until he was 10 years old. But he did not give up. He was committed, and he later became the 28th president of the United States. I could go on and on with story after story of people who made up their minds to exercise and work and fight against the weakness that had come to them. John Piper, the great uh, speaker, said, The gospel is not a help-wanted ad. It is a help available ad. God is not looking for people to work for him, but people who will let him work mightily in and through him. And I believe that's what the Apostle Paul had come to when he realized that this isn't me doing things for God. This is God doing things through me. And the closer I am to him, even in my weakness, is the best thing for me. There was a fellow named Jacob in the Old Testament. Jacob was a, he was a rascal. Jacob was a rascal. God called a rascal. He was a wheeler dealer. He was tough. He was strong. He was outdoors. He was all of that. But his brother was 10 times meaner than he was. But the thing about Jacob was when he was going through the desert, there came a time when an angel came down and wrestled with him. Now, I don't know if you've ever really thought that through, what that means. You're minding your own business, you're going through the desert, you've got your flocks, you've got your herds, you've got your family, and here comes some fella and he's standing there challenging you to personal combat. And he's going to wrestle. And it was an angel. And I think Jacob knew it was an angel. Well, what do you do? Well, he wrestled. That's what fellas do. So they wrestled and they flip-flopped and went back and forth all night long. And pretty soon, the angel just did this. He just reached over there and touched him on his thigh. And his hip went out of joint. <laughs> That's a pretty good wrestling move, isn't it? Kind of demoralize your opponent, knock his hip out of joint. But here's what happened. Okay, guess what, Jacob? You're not winning this bout. You're not going to pin this angel. You're not going to win. You're not a good enough wrestler. On top of that, you're weak now. Your hip is out of joint. You're worn out. So what did he do? He just kept holding on. And he didn't let go. And the angel says, let me go. And he said, I'm not going to let you go till you bless me. And he got a death grip on him. He was defeated. He was beat. He was weak. He knew it. But he knew this was a divine being. He knew this was something special. And he said, I want you to bless me. And he said, what's your name? And he said, Jacob. And he said, it's going to be Israel now. That means a prince with God. Because you have contended with God and have prevailed. Prevailed? <laughs> how did he prevail? You know how he prevailed? He didn't give up. That's the only thing he did. The only thing he could do. He wasn't smart enough. He wasn't strong enough. He wasn't cunning enough. He, he wasn't man enough. But one thing he was, was he could be persistent. And he wasn't going to quit. That's who Jacob was. And God says, okay, I can deal with him. And here's what happened when he got up. When he got up and started walking, he limped as he walked. And I, there are those who believe he had a limp from then on. He's a man that limped before God. Now, I said all that to say this. Every one of us here today has some kind of limp or another. We have some kind of weakness. We have something that we wish was stronger and isn't. We have some handicap that we wish we didn't have. We have some deficit that we wish we didn't have. But one thing I know for sure is God knows about that. And He's on it. And He is working him, His grace through us. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 27. Let's turn. We'll close with this. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 27 through 29. But God hath chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. God hath chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things which are mighty. And base things of the world and things which are despised hath God chosen. Yea, and things which are not to bring to naught things that are 
that no flesh should glory in his presence. You want to be strong? You want to be truly strong? You want to be strong in a way that strength really means something? Admit your weakness before God. And here's the best way to admit your weakness before God. Lord, I am not righteous enough to deserve heaven. Lord, I am not good in myself. I am a sinner. I need saving. I need God. I need Jesus. You will never, ever, ever be able to go to heaven without the blood of Jesus Christ. His death on the cross is how anybody gets to heaven. And we have to be honest enough and admit our weakness and say no matter how righteously I try to live, no matter how religious I try to be, no matter how good a moral a person I try to live, I am not going to be able to be righteous before God unless God does a work in my heart through Jesus Christ. Listen, if you haven't been saved, you need to be saved. If you haven't been born again, you need to be born again. If you haven't done business at the cross, you need to admit your weakness before God and let Him give you the strength of His salvation. And then you begin to understand what Paul said, when I am weak, then am am I strong. Jesus said that they who, uh, uh, who lift themselves up will be put down, but he who humbles himself shall be lifted up. Dear Father... I pray that any under the sound of my voice at this time, Lord, that have yet to make life's most important decision would come to Christ for salvation, would in their own mind and heart say, Lord Jesus, I'm sorry for my sins. I realize that I need forgiveness and I need saving. I need transformation. I need to be made into a new creature. I need the supernatural new birth that I've heard people talk about. I need it from Jesus. And Lord Jesus, I accept you as my Savior, and I believe you rose from the dead. And I believe that if I trust you, that I will go to heaven when I die. Lord, I pray that someone would pray that prayer and mean it today and become gloriously born again. Lord, I pray for all of us who have already come to the Lord and realize how weak we are. Lord, that we would be able to operate more in your strength by depending on you rather than ourselves. Lord, that we would uh, allow you to be the strength through us that only you can provide. For it's in Jesus' name.